we're pretty familiar with the story of Jonah. It's one of the favorite kids' stories, isn't it? I mean, maybe kids, let, let's start here. When you think, you know, you heard me say Jonah, what, what are some things that come to mind to you from, from this story, from the person of Jonah, the prophet Jonah? You can just kind of scream it out. What do, you, what do you remember from this story? Nineveh, he's thrown into the sea. What else? Fish, and then, okay, very good. What else, Jennifer? Disobedience, okay, very good. Anything else anybody remembers that just kind of... And then he obeyed. Hey, good, he, there's some good there. Not, it's all not bad. Uh, it's not all... Very good. Well, if we look, we're going to spend our time today in Jonah chapter 1. We're going to begin... Um, we're, we're just going to look at this first chapter. And this is how the story or the book begins. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying... Now, this is a very typical way. If you read through the prophets, the prophetic literature, beginning in Isaiah and ending with Malachi, you will notice that this is kind of how every single poetic book or prophetic book begins. However, the book of Jonah is unique. It's really different from all those other books because all the other prophetic books are about the prophet's message to the people of Israel or the people surrounding the nation of Israel. Uh, the prophets teach God's word to them. They warn them. They rebuke them. They give them hope or they threaten them. The book of Jonah is very different because it's not about God's message so much as it is about the messenger of God. In other words, the book of Jonah is not about prophetic speech, but about, it's about the prophet who responds to his Lord in a particular way. Now, while it would be nice for us to start the book right here, there is a very important context that many people are kind of not aware of. And that is something simple as, do you guys know that this is not the first time that the prophet Jonah appears in the Bible? So I know that with most of the other prophets, right, Obadiah, you can't, Obadiah is just, Obad, that's all we know about Obadiah, or, Ma, or Malachi. And many of the prophets are like that. However, the story of Jonah actually begins in the book of 2 Kings. And let me invite you there. It is a really important background to, um, to what happens here in Jonah chapter 1. Because to those who are reading this story, they've met Jonah before. They've met him in their history. Now by the time we get to 2 Kings, you understand that 1 Kings preceded that, and there's a lot of history, Israel, Israel's history. And a lot of it is, up until this point, is pretty negative. It's pretty sad. It's pretty painful. Now here's what I mean. If you remember, the, the height of Israelite history was under David and then Solomon, where they had a lot of territory. The promises of God were coming true. The king was faithful. Under Solomon, they were so wealthy that they were attracting the attention of the whole known world at that time where people came in and People were coming in and saying, what we heard, the rumors that we heard about you, they, they tell half the, half the story. It is way more amazing and way more incredible than you could think of. Now, unfortunately, things did not remain as rosy and beautiful. You remember that Solomon's son, under his leadership, the kingdom split into two. The northern, t tri the northern t ten tribes became known as Israel, and the southern two were Judah. Now, does anybody remember by any chance, what was the name of the first king of Israel? The guy who split away the ten tribes. Yeah. It wasn't God. It would be good if it was God. So, Saul was the first king of, yeah, the, the combined. Jeroboam, thank you, there we go. It was Jeroboam. Uh, he was acting under God's guidance, as a punishment to the nation of Israel. However, when he split away the ten kingdoms, what happened was he became a wicked king himself, and he set the trajectory for the remainder of history of these ten tribes by building two altars and forcing Israel to worship foreign gods 
and deities. So when we get to now, this becomes important, because not a single good king reigns in Israel from that point on. They are bad, and this is a few hundred years later, and the king that Jonah appears under is called Jeroboam II. I, right away, you know, this is, this is not good. This is not a good time. And in fact, Israel has been in severe oppression. God is punishing them using the Assyrians. They, the morale is low, they're in hiding, they're poor, they're oppressed. And so Jeroboam comes to the throne. Let's look at 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 14, beginning in verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years, a really long time. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the bo- Now this is important. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the sea of the Arabah according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Goth Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, So he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So imagine the context into which Jonah comes on the scene here. This probably happened uh, early in Jeroboam's reign. And even though he is wicked, God sends a prophet, a prophet who prophesies, prophesies that God will once again bless his people. God will once again bless the nation of Israel. And in fact, Jeroboam extends the border of Israel, these ten tribes, takes back some of the lands that the Syrians and the Assyrians have taken back, and under his rule, there's quite a bit of prosperity. Now, if you slow down and if you think about it, how do you think that fared on Jonah? Do you think he was seen in the, do you think he was known in the land of Israel? How do you think people saw him? You see, when we come to Jonah chapter 1 here, it says the word of the Lord came to him, Jonah is already in a certain place within the nation of Israel. He was the prophet that foretold that God would begin to bless. And not only that he, was, he foretold it, it actually came to be. A serious power declined at that time for a number of reasons. Israel's borders expanded. There was peace, there was prosperity. There was no worship of God, but there was peace and prosperity. So Jonah probably, almost certainly, grew in the people's eyes. He probably grew in his own eyes. And so he is kind of at the height of his life when we come to this, story, when we come to this point in the story. Now before we take a look at what happens next, It is almost startling to see how much things change by the end of chapter 1. And I want you to see this. A prophet whom God uses to bless the wicked nation of Israel, who is called the servant of God, not only that, the one to whom God speaks, right? Once again, God chooses to speak through Jonah. By the end of chapter 1, he finds himself where? He finds himself thrown overboard and in verse 17 and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights now why this is so startling and so significant is that this doesn't happen to Jonah because he's obedient to the Lord this doesn't happen to him because he is persecuted for his faith like the other prophets, like, right? Jeremiah preaches against Israel and he's thrown into the pit. Why? Because he said the things that the king of Israel did not want to hear from the Lord. Now the reality is that Jonah finds himself in the belly of the fish because Jonah was disobeying and running away from God. 
And it's this stark contrast, beginning and end, that I want us to think about and consider. What was it that happened? What was it that happened to Jonah that resulted in such a turn of events in his life? You see, every single one of us sitting here would almost find this, maybe in some ways fantastical, from a perspective like, this would never happen to me, right? Especially if you're a Christian. I mean, as you look at your life, there are certain things that you are, I mean, you are absolutely sure. Whatever 2021 brings, however similar or dissimilar it is to 2020, I mean, you know that where you're at and where you could end up, I mean, no way would you be punished by God like this. No way would you be running away from God like Jonah. And I think it's that false security here that we could learn from Jonah. So as we read chapter 1, which I'm going to read right now, I want you to be thinking about that. What is it? What is it that causes this downfall of Jonah? What can we learn from his life from this first chapter? Let's come back to Jonah chapter 1 and begin in verse 1 again. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it, excuse me, to lighten it for them. But Jonah had got down into the inner part of the ship and had lay down and was fast asleep. So the captain came up and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us, on whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of the heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the man knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more temptuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us the innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly, And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So what do we see happening with Jonah? What is the way that this story opens up? Now if you were paying very close attention to the first few verses, a few things are repeated time and time again. Look here. Look at verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. When God appears this time to Jonah, and when God tells him that he has a different job assignment for Jonah, The first time that God appeared in Jonah's life, God told him, you need to go and tell your people that good times are coming. Things are going to turn out for you. I will bless you. I will give you military victory. I will 
lift off from you the yoke, the slavery, the difficulty, the poverty that will bring riches. He, great, he gladly went. However, when God comes into the picture and says, Jonah, I need you now to go on a different assignment. I need you to go to Nineveh, that great city in verse 2, and call out against it. Jonah has a very different response. And here's the very first thing we see with Jonah here. He is pursuing distance from God. The first step down the road to being at the height of his relationship with God, to being in the belly punished, is that Jonah begins to pursue distance from God. Now let me, uh, Ed, if you could put up that picture, just, to, just so that you could see what's happening. There's Joppa right there. Now what's interesting about this little port is that it was never actually annexed and taken captive by Israel during Old Testament times. It wasn't until the Maccabean revolt that this became Israel territory. So wherever Jonah is at, he hears the voice of God. He begins to get away from God by going to this port. Because he knew that likely here, nobody would recognize him. He knew that here were not people who were worshiping the God of Israel. He knew that nobody would be asking him questions of why are you going. And as you see there, God wanted Jonah to go, you know, somewhere, what is that, northeast to Nineveh, which was about 550 miles away. And instead, Jonah boards a ship to go to Tarshish, which is obviously more than 2,500 miles away if you go the route of the ships. Tarshish was the furthest outpost. If you slow down and think about it, this is sort of like when Jonah says, I want to go to Tarshish, he's saying, I want to go as far away as I can, right? Something like some of you have heard maybe said it, you know, we're going to go to Timbuktu. Wherever that's, whatever that is, it is as far away from here as possibly can be. Now here's Here's the point that this picture draws for us and what we see here in these verses. That when Jonah encounters a God he doesn't recognize or he encounters God wanting him to do something that he is not ready to do, he foolishly thinks that the way out is to distance himself from the presence of God, right? It's repeated time and time again, two times actually. He went to flee to Tarshish, why? from the presence of the Lord. Verse 3, he went to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now I want you all to slow down for just a moment. This is so common and this, this seems ridiculous to us, doesn't it? I mean, you can't flee from God's presence. God is everywhere. I mean, hasn't Jonah read Psalm 139? We know Psalm 139. But I want you to slow down because one of the things that the book of Jonah should do for us, and I'm really convinced of this, is that while the story of Jonah is very simple and it's a favorite story of children, the depth of this book require an adult brain to actually figure out and to see. You see, the message that we see in Jonah is really, it, it really isn't accessible to children. It really is mostly accessible to adults, those who have walked with the Lord any period of time. Those who have experienced pain and disappointment in their life. Now why is this point so significant about pursuing distance from the Lord? Every single one of us knows what Jonah is doing here. In fact, I would venture to say you have had this experience this week. You didn't flee to Tarshish. You didn't flee as far as you can. But how many of you have found yourself in this past week, this past month, maybe even today, in a place where you knew God wanted something from you? Where God exposed a sin in your heart? Where God called upon you to make peace with your spouse when you were in an argument? How about when God wanted you to act in a certain sense in front of your coworkers? What was your response like? What is your response like here when you fail? When you find yourself in a place of sin? When you find yourself clearly, knowingly in the wrong? You know, it's interesting. 
uh, working through, interesting and sad, working through church discipline cases in our church, um, people who, who have fallen into sin. You know, it's so clear how early on what happens when sin takes a heart captive. Sometimes it's small, but it's always a little bit secretive, and it always pushes you away from other believers. It pushes you away from fellowship with your friends who kind of know your life. It pushes you away to where you begin to have excuses of why you're not coming to church. You begin to draw out and have plenty of reasons why you're not reading your Bibles, why you're not praying. There's all sorts of excuses that come in where you begin to, see, to say, well, those people are hypocritical. Those people don't care, don't love. You begin to ignore when people try to go after you. Friends, when we read the story of Jonah here, it began as something maybe, I mean, it's horrible. God told Jonah, do this. This is one of the only few times in the Bible where, you know, the prophet says, no, thank you, and goes completely the other way. But the story of Jonah, it actually, if you look at it, the steps that he's taking, right, he gets into this ship and pursuing after God, he hears God after him in the storm, he hears God after him in the storm, and he just, he thinks, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna shut down. I'm gonna go to sleep. I'm gonna ignore. Now when he no longer can ignore, when, when there's a captain, a pagan captain in his door, and he's saying, what's going on? Where the whole truth comes out, and the reason why the whole company's in danger is because of Jonah? It's fascinating, Jonah's response. He's wandered so far away from God, what is his response? He says, pick me up, verse 12, and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. He's in an utterly hopeless place. He no longer wants to hear truth, care to truth. He no longer even wants to lift his eyes up to God. In fact, instead of obeying and looking to God, Jonah basically says, I'd rather die. Friends, that is a really scary reality. This story really is quite a bit of a warning to every single one of us. As we look at our hearts, as we look at our circumstances, as we look at the realities that we find ourselves in. When God throws a curveball into your life, and boy, were there a ton of them in 2020, We didn't need 2020 to happen to experience curveballs. You look back, years back, right? 2019, 2018, 2017. Some of you even looking at this year, at 2021 already. You see, when Jonah heard God again, the last thing that he was expecting, I guarantee it, was that God would tell him, go to Nineveh. When Jonah woke up that morning, not in his wildest imagination would he imagine that when he heard the voice of God, he would run as far away from God as he can. Let me ask you, as you look at your life, as you look at your own heart, as you consider the difficulties that you encounter, be they big, be they small, are there areas in your life that you are pursuing to distance yourself from God? We're going to come back to this a little bit later again, but are there areas which you have kind of closed off and where you know what the truth is? You know what God expects of you. You know what the way forward is. But instead, you are choosing to, in that area, you close it off. In that area, you say, the pain is too great. The cost is too much. The change is too significant. Friend, if you create those kinds of spaces, those spaces are like weeds. They tend to grow. It begins with one area. It begins, for instance, with an area of forgiving somebody who has wronged you. And it grows into bitterness against that person. And then it grows into bitterness against everybody who is on that person's side. Then it grows bitterness against God. 
and where you slowly find yourself, instead of nearer, you find yourself so far away from God that you would never even recognize that that was ever possible. You see, this warning, what causes Jonah's downfall? It's pursuing distance from God. And the story is meant to call us, you can't flee from God's distance. You can't flee from God's presence. Pursue him closer. Number two, number two, what we see in Jonah, why does this happen? Why does this happen with Jonah? Why is he pursuing distance from God? And that is, Jonah has an expectation that God will conform to him. Jonah is expecting God to conform to him. Or, if we put it in our language as I put it up there, it's expecting God to conform to us. Jonah thinks that the fact that he said no to God, God will leave him alone, right? He flees, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had got down into the inner part of the ship, and had laid down and was fast asleep. Jonah's response is shocking. He is deaf to God, and he's basically, look at, what, look at what Jonah's hoping for. If I ignore God long enough, he will let me be. I mean, I think I've made it pretty clear to God. God, you want me to go northeast? I'm going west. I'm going to the end of the known world. I don't, I don't want what you want me to do. I don't want to be part of your plan. Now the key word there that I am want to highlight that I want to look at is that word expecting. Expecting. And friends, we shouldn't be too hard on Jonah here before we slow down. What God asked of Jonah was truly radical and truly frightening. You see, in those words when God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, Jonah heard one of the most terrifying things he could ever hear. One of the most terrifying things that we could hear is that God had expressed love, interest, and concern for Jonah's bitterest enemies. Like I said, Israel has been oppressed for quite a few years by the Assyrians. And they were truly a horrific people. When they would go in, when they would go into a city and capture it, they would gather up all the leaders of the city, and in front of the whole city, they would skin them alive as an object lesson to, this is what's going to happen to you if you continue to resist us. Israel has been paying tribute to Assyria at this point in time. So that those things have happened to Israelites on their territory. They're being taxed by this foreign country. And here, instead of a message of judgment against them, Jonah hears that he has to bring some sort of a message where they potentially can repent. That is really difficult to hear. Now, I don't think it too much of a stretch to slow down and think. Jonah's expectation here, right? He's thinking, I'm a Hebrew. He said this himself. To us belong the promises. God has spoken blessing to us He's going to bring through us, through me, the blessing to Israel. And now you want me to go to our bitterest enemies so that, God, you wouldn't judge them, so that they would repent, so that they would potentially grow in power and authority and continue to oppress us? That is way too much, Lord. I'm not ready for that. You see, every single one of us, the reason I highlight this and the reason I slow down on this aspect here, expecting God to conform us, Every single one of us, the most dangerous thing to us is not like some of you who are part of conservative circles, the, the, the danger is liberalism for us. You know, denying God, denying miracles, denying that the Bible is inerrant, denying certain moral values. We think that's the most dangerous thing. You know what the most dangerous thing in front of every, inside of every single human heart is various forms of prosperity theology. And here's what I mean. God blesses those who bless him. God takes care and doesn't call those who are on his side to difficult things. 
You see, Jonah's expectation is that God's will will always be for his life to pronounce blessing, to pronounce that which will bring prosperity to his people. I mean, this is a suicide career move for him. Lord, do you know what my people will think of me? I went to the Ninevites to proclaim the good news. God, I, I'm, do, what kind of reputation will I have? How will, how will my people accept me back when they find out that this is the mission that I went on? Now slow down. And just think about this. God's expectation is different from Jonah's on what God wants to take and use us, wants to use him for. You see, in that call that God places on Jonah, he really exposes Jonah's heart. He really exposes Jonah's expectations. Jonah is more than ready and more than welcome to invite God along the journey of life that he's going for, as long as God is keeping step in step with Jonah. As long as God is okay about blessing Jonah. As long as God is okay doing things Jonah's way. But as soon as there's conflict, as soon as there's a different vision for life, as soon as there are unbelievable expectations placed on him, Jonah bounces because he expects that God will conform to him. We see this in the act of rebellion where Jonah thinks that God will just leave him alone. God will choose somebody else. Every single one of us, we have those, again, those secret corners of our lives. We have those secret sins. We have those deep bitternesses towards people. We have those things that we know God wants us to pursue and to do. But we're hoping that with time, God will forget about those things. We're hoping that maybe with time, God will no longer require and be interested in conforming us to his will. As we encounter Jonah here, friends, we encounter ourselves and we encounter something really deep inside of us. When we come to the Lord, when we sing the songs that we sang about salvation, what is our expectation of the Lord to keep doing within every single one of us? Are we ready for God to come into our hearts and point out the deep sins in there and expect and have an expectation for us to change them? Are we hoping that God will conform to our life, to our plans, to our desires, the kids we will have, the jobs we will pursue, the way that our country will turn out? Or are we ready on the inside to accept God's will for our lives? and the transformation that needs to happen there. Let me slow down. Let me have you ask the Lord right now, within your heart, as you look up, as you, as you think about, what are the areas in your life that God is calling you? What's your Nineveh, in a sense? What is the Nineveh that you're facing that you want to pursue God away from that? You know, young people, those of you who are in school, those of you who are just beginning your careers, is, is your Nineveh acceptance maybe? Acceptance by the world around you? Acceptance to be thought of as cool? To not be holier, you know, to not be super holy? To be in with the crowd? You know, to be just like that, you know, walking on a thin razor of being Christian so that people know you're morally good, but you're not a Jesus freak? Where in your life are you hoping that God would change his standard, his call, his desire on you personally? And lastly, let's briefly take a look. There's a fascinating verse here uh, that always uh, blows me away. As the sailors discover, again, God is in miraculous ways. In miraculous ways, God is using... Uh, the storm and then the dice 
and they figure out that this is Jonah. And they come to him, verse 8, and they said to him, Tell us, on whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Now listen to Jonah's response. I am, I am blown away. Um, I'm blown away by his response because his response is in so many ways spot on. His theology couldn't be better. Well, just listen to this. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. And I'm not sure what he means by that. But I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. I mean, in some sense, for the ancient world, I mean, this would be I mean, this is what my kids would answer, right, in the New Testament way. If they are, somebody's asking them, who are you? Who do you stand for? What do you believe in? Right, this is the New Testament equivalent. You know, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Bible. I believe in the God of the Bible. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the, Go- the Holy Spirit. I believe in God the Father. I believe that God is the creator over all and everything. This is a good answer. So what's the problem with it? Here's how I try to formulate it. Jonah is keeping his theology selectively relevant. Keeping your theology selectively relevant. It's interesting, Jonah tries to flee from the presence of the Lord who made what? The sea and the dry land. Jonah thinks he can get away from this God. Jonah thinks that He fears the Lord. He knows that he's a God of heaven. Now friends, this one is in various ways maybe tricky and difficult to think about. But one of the things that is really wonderful about so many of you, especially those of you who have been part of our church for a long time, is that you have pretty good theology. I mean, uh, you could have if given a a little bit of time to prepare, you could have been doing the catechisms up here, right? Give you some time to think. You could could take those questions and you can present them. If somebody asks you a little bit of a more challenging theological question about God's sovereignty, man's free will, about the end times, about the moral state of the country, about all sorts of things, you're pretty well versed in theology. And that is a really good thing. I I don't want to say that's a bad thing. I mean, we're pretty good as a congregation generally to identify and smell out error, you know, and compromise. Just like Jonah, we're pretty good. But as we look, as we look at what's going on around us, how much are we taking that theoretical theology and making it relevant to our lives. Sorry, again, this is maybe just because it's right in front of us. Uh, We keep coming back to this, but when four years ago Trump defeated Hillary Clinton, the Lord was on our side, right, for so many. The Lord was in control. The Lord made his thing happen. The world wasn't going to end after all. That would have happened a few weeks ago. I mean, what is still happening to many of you? Stolen elections, all of these things. Again, I'm not, I'm not here to make a political statement saying, no, they weren't stolen, or yes, they were. I don't, that's besides the point. My point here is that as we look at big things happening in the world, for instance, which every, so many of us are involved in, wherever you fall in that divide, how good are you taking your theology, the God of heaven and earth, the God who controls, who is sovereign, How is that landing in your heart? How is that landing in your relationship to other Christians who think a little bit differently about what happened or what should happen? How how sovereign is the Lord? Calling sin out when he needs to be called. See, Jonah is really happy to pronounce that he is a Hebrew. He's really happy to pronounce blessing on those whom he loves and cares. But taking a step towards people who have heard him, who have heard his nation, who are 
complete enemies of God and offering them any kind of degree of hope. Here's where the relevance of his theology is kept at bay. Theology information is an extremely dangerous tool. It is unfo- it's, it's true, but it's unfortunate that very often churches that are most theologically illiterate are also not very friendly, not very loving, not very accepting. People who are armchair theologians very often are not like Jesus at all. Friends, we, God has blessed us with good teaching, I think. With resources. Many of you read a lot of things. You listen to a lot of good podcasts. You have good evaluations. But let me ask you, are you selective? Are you selective in your application of your theology? Are you selective in terms of only allowing the theology you know to apply to where it benefits you and to where it does not radically reshape and reorient how you look at the world? Is your theology costing you anything? I mean, that's a good question to ask. I don't mean necessarily financially, but I mean worldview. I mean acceptance. I mean letting go and trusting. See, Jonah, we see all of these things in this first chapter. Where it hurt, where he disagreed with God, he distanced himself. He did that because God wasn't conforming to his expectations. God had a bigger vision for the world and for whom he was going to save than Jonah was willing to accept. Yes, Lord, bless all of us, even though we're worshiping at all these false temples and we're not following your laws at all. Bless us, but the Syrians over my dead body, right? Literally. And why is that? That's because what Jonah knew He applied it in the most convenient and comfortable places in his life versus uniformly everywhere. Here's where I want to come back, though. Where will we end? I want to just draw your attention as we look to close this, our time in Jonah chapter 1. Jonah 1, 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Verse 17, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. You know what's fascinating in this story of Jonah? God plays central role as the initiator and the one who pursues. You see there the title, In Pursuit of, of Rebels. If you were to ask Jonah, were Ninevites rebels? He would say, Absolutely. If you were to ask us, was the nation of Israel a rebel? Yeah. Or even some of us are really reluctant to call Jonah a rebel. But when we slow down and we take a look at, are we rebels as well? And we are, and this is the story of this first chapter. God is in pursuit of rebels like me and like you. Remember that hymn from the 18th century, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing? You guys remember how the third stanza goes? Prone to, lo- prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And then the writer says, Take my heart and take and seal it for thy courts above. Look, God has a myriad of ways of pursuing us. And even this morning, he's pursuing every single one of you wherever you're at. Early in Jonah's life, God pursued him by telling him that he would preach a message of blessing. Later in his life, as Jonah is rebelling against the Lord, there's a different way that God is pursuing him. He's throwing him in the middle of a storm that threatens his life. When Jonah continues to resist, we see God continuing to persist. 
And God sends a fish that would swallow him, that would cause him to slow down and reflect a little bit. This is true of every single one of us. Do you hear where you're at right now? Do you hear and see that the circumstances that are maybe horrible, difficult, that are confusing, the things that you're facing that are uncomfortable and require too much of you, are you hearing and seeing God in that place pursuing you? It's your opportunity, friend. It's your opportunity not to continue to resist. The worst thing that could happen to you is the worst thing that could, happen, could have happened to Jonah is when God finally gives up and says, where well, there's no more, and the Lord did this, and the Lord did this. While God is calling, while God is hurling, while God is appointing, while God is speaking, while God is sending, look, this is your chance to reverse what Jonah did. This is your chance to come And instead of push yourself away from God because you're so dirty, because it's so difficult, because you're so not ready, this is actually your opportunity to come and and to open it up because God knows. This is your opportunity to say, God, your vision is bigger and more difficult. Help me conform instead of helping, instead of me conforming you to me. Maybe this is a time where you say, you know what, this is, there are, these are places in my life where I need to land my theology. It's so easy to say God is good and God's ways are best. How about where you don't want them to be how God wants them to be? Let me invite you to stand. We're going to pray, and after we pray, we, we have two songs that we want to reflect on. Right? We purposefully have... Instead of one, we have two songs at the end. Why? We want to use them as times for reflection, as times of response. We're going to sing, Be Thou Our Vision. It's very fitting. And as a concluding song, we're going to focus on, Oh, Church Arise, right? The The goal is not simply to wallow and to be crushed. The call is that God wants us to arise and to go to Nineveh, and to conquer those things which stand before us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness and kindness to us. We are rebels who run from you in so many different ways and directions. But you pursue us. And I know this morning you're pursuing us. I trust that you're speaking to our hearts to the children and adults, those who are older and younger, those who are mature in their more, more mature in their faith and those who are not. You're pursuing, Lord, this morning, those who are even sitting here in our midst who are in sin, who are in hiding, who have erected a blockade, who know you're sending them to Nineveh, but their face is turned to Tarshish. Lord, break that down. Send the wind, the storm, the fish. We want to be those who look to you. We want to be those who in this time are arising together and carrying your message forward. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.